My Story of the Week, and up with Chris Hayes exclusive. Speaker Boehner's lobbying buddies are proposing a hit job on Occupy Wall Street. This week here at UP, we obtained a memo written for the American Bankers Association that lays out a plan for a nearly $1 million campaign against Occupy Wall Street and any politicians who might express sympathy for Occupy Wall Street, including specific Democratic politicians in contested races. The memo was prepared by the Washington lobbying firm Clark, Lytle, Geduldig, and Cranford, or CLGC for short. Two of the partners at the firm are former aides to Speaker John Boehner, and the firm's website boasts of its closeness to the current speaker. Prepared as a pitch document for the American Bankers Association, a client of CLGC, the memo lays out the political threat Occupy Wall Street poses for the banks and their sworn defenders in the Republican Party. Democratic victories in 2012, the authors write, would mean more than just short-term political discomfort for Wall Street firms. It has the potential to have very long-lasting political, policy, and financial impacts on the companies in the center of the bullseye. So here we have, in black and white, former Boehner aides who now lobby for Wall Street, admitting Democrats will be tougher on Wall Street, and they also admit that Occupy Wall Street and emboldened Democrats might push Republicans to distance themselves from Wall Street's bigger firms. The bigger concern, in the words of the memo's authors, quote, should be that Republicans will no longer defend Wall Street companies. In order to head off this terrifying eventuality, the memo proposes a program of opposition research on Occupy Wall Street activists, which, quote, will also identify opportunities to construct fact-based negative narratives of the OWS for high-impact media placement to expose the backers. They admit that individual companies under threat by OWS and its adoption by Democrats likely will not be the best spokespeople for their own cause because, well, everyone hates the bankers. So the former Boehner aides who now lobby for Wall Street sketch out a strategy of deploying proxies to shield for Wall Street and against Occupy without the public knowing. The former Boehner aides also urge big banks to punish politicians who target them early on in order to send a message. Quote, a big challenge is to demonstrate that these companies still have political strength and that making them a political target will carry a severe political cost. And they say that a strong media placement early in a transition to adopt the OWS movement will send a powerful signal about the risks of carrying that through. One goal of this campaign, the former Boehner aides turned Wall Street lobbyists right, is to, quote, provide cover for political figures who defend the industry. They are proposing a campaign using Wall Street money to defend Wall Street's political allies and specifically targeting Democratic politicians for re-election who might stand up to Wall Street. Naming Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown and identifying Senate races in Florida, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Wisconsin, and New Mexico for targeting as well. It was always clear that if Occupy Wall Street began to have some success, it would precipitate a massive backlash from the powers that be. And now we've seen this week, as I said, the empire strike back. We placed a call to Clark, Lytle, Gedeldig, and Cranford to ask them about the memo, and they did not respond. The American Bankers Association told us, quote, our government relations staff did receive the proposal, it was unsolicited, and we chose not to act on it in any way. Nevertheless, what's contained in this short memo are all of the most craven, corrupt, and insidious forces of the status quo coming together to squash Occupy. In fact, the document represents just about everything wrong with America in four short pages. We have a lobbying firm whose webpage glowingly advertises that Sam Gedeldig, a former Boehner staffer, quote, knows how to kill legislative threats to his clients, drawing up a battle plan for the financial industry and its 1% members to use their deep pockets to attack the Occupy movement and protect the bank's financial interests by creating, quote, political cover for bank-friendly policies. And while doing this, they would, of course, have the help and connections of fellow partner Jay Cranford, who just a few short months ago was working as a policy aide to Speaker Boehner. Here's the thing to consider. This is the most important point. This is just one memo from one firm that we just happened to get our hands on. Think for a moment of how many similar documents are floating around out there, how much money and power is being amassed to make sure that Occupy Wall Street is just a brief fad, a quirky cultural moment we'll all vaguely recall years hence. That's if the 1% get their way. We'll post the memo on our website, up.msnbc.com, after the program's over. I'll be talking about this story on weekends with Alex Witt right after the program. And on Up Tomorrow, Senator Sherrod Brown joins us to respond to the plan.
Steele responding to the Geduldig memo that we just broke here on up. He says, quite uh, cleverly, my understanding is that President Obama is the single, single largest recipient of donations from Wall Street, but this is a pol political question, not a policy question, so you'll have to take it up with the RNC. Melissa, you have a reaction to the, uh, to the memo? Um, only, I suppose, that it, um, you know, you frame it as like this is this is all the most evil, horrible right, right. things possible, um, and and maybe, right. um, but but it's also true that that just as much as we were talking about uh, protest is about disrupting the status quo. I mean, you got to expect the status quo to, to try to protect itself. Right, yeah. um, and in fact, one of the things I was having a conversation with a colleague about yesterday is, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we shift the public opinion of those who are part of the 99 percent. At the same time, that we're saying the 99 percent is terribly disempowered. So I guess for me part of what would be interesting is to ask how do we shift the incentives for the one percent yeah how do we make the incentive structure different and typically we've used the tax code to do that right but but there must be some way to uh, so, so I guess in other words I'm a little less outraged and appalled than I am sort of feeling like well you know this is this is what it means to control totally. the, the yeah. resources well, and I, what I think is feeling good. the fascinating thing about that memo is that for anybody who kind of has doubts about whether the Occupy Wall Street movement is effective as I've had sure. from time to time um, I kind of keep going back and forth on it, that seems about as kind of dispositive and um, a statement of the fact that this movement is really accomplishing something. I mean, I think that... It's, it's, an, it's an amazing statement of priorities, though. I mean, this is the, an industry facing complete collapse, they suggest, and we need to save this entire sector, <laughs> and they're going to pay less than a million dollars? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> well, this is just one firm trying to jump, <laughs> drum up some business, yes, I should yes, add. Yes, so yes. clearly, your bankers. last point was really the important one, right. is this is an incompetent pitch, and just imagine... the. If a good one came. Really right. Going through. Right. Right. You know, here's, here's what's interesting to me about this is what's the fear that's expressed in the memo? The fear is that uh, Occupy is going to hook up with a Tea Party and it's going to be yeah. sort of game over for the establishment. Right. Um, and I think that points to, one, yes, that, that Occupy is making a dent in, in sort of in public understanding of what's going on in politics these days, also shaking up the people at the top, but specifically in this context where they say, you know, it's not just about sort of the radical left seizing the moment, it's about the radical left and the radical right, right. sitting down with each other and saying, well, wait a minute, is right. there something we can rethink here? And so, you know, when you uh, rhapsodize about uh, slogans like, this is a global uprising, right. I don't think that's a winning message with the American people. Um, I do think that when you look at something like Occupy Memphis, I believe, where uh, the Tea Partiers basically said, "Hey guys, let's you know, let's they have coffee." Together. They they sat down. They actually had you know had their own be your own town hall, right? There's a great idea, um, and it actually worked. And I think if that starts happening across the country, um, if that kind of arrangement becomes popular and catches on. Uh, then the fears expressed in that memo might very well come true. And I think I, I should point out that the, 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 this lobbying firm lobbied heavily for TARP, right? Which is which is the, the, the bell, which is the sort of point I think of the, the, the most intense point of intersection between the grievances that, that that both of these sides share, and and that that most sort of pits the kind of establishment and the Beltway uh, against sort of popular sentiment. Well, how likely do you think that is? I mean, that Memphis story that came out this week was pretty interesting, and I think simply having made the overture got a lot of points mm -hmm. on both sides. Clearly, there are some cultural differences. <laughs> you but think? The, the Fears, yeah, I think. Um, but the fears expressed in this memo, I think, are real at that level. And, and I'm just curious what you think in terms of the likelihood of any kind of uh, partnership ever being brokered success. Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's an important question. I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say there might be important regional differences here. Yeah. You're not going to see this happen in Oakland. Right. You're not going to right. see this happen on the sort of eastern power corridor. Right. If you're going to see it happen, it's going to happen in the midsection of the country, I think. Uh, we're going to talk more about this right after this break. All right, we are back here with James Polis, Michelle Goldberg, Laura Flanders, and Melissa Harris-Perry. Um, ben Smith at Politico put up this graphic, and I think a few other people have uh, recently, to show the one way in which I think unquestionably Occupy Wall Street has been effective. Um, and this speaks to why you have a, lobby, a Washington lobbying firm writing to the American Bankers Association saying, we got to do something about this. This is, uh, this is appearances of the phrase income, inequal income equality in news since September. Do we have that? There we go. Income inequality in the news. Um, and there you see it. It's, it's gone up about five-fold over the, over the two-month um, yeah. life of Occupy Wall Street. And I think this is a place where the agenda-setting power of it is mm -hmm. just indisputable and evident. And to me, what's so remarkable is when we were having this conversation, the Tea Party was amazingly effective yep. in completely centering the national conversation on government being too big, 
deficit, cuts, 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 cuts. Completely effective. And we are living yeah. with that, that, that effectiveness in the, in the body of the super committee. The conversation has shifted now, but there's a weird moment we're in in which the conversation we're having is about income inequality and jobs and the, the machinery of policy. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but this is the point, because this is the, this is the place where the Tea Party beats Occupy Wall Street. It just is the one place, and that is they ran candidates for office and won and went to Washington. And we are now, I, my bet is, it's just a hypothesis that if you were to map that same graph against deficit reduction, that it would be going down it just doesn't. as the conversation. In fact, that, that, that graph exists and you are correct. Yeah, very good. Okay. So, um, so, good, so good on that. And, but my bet, but the fact is that the super committee is still in there talking about deficit reduction, not income inequality. So yes, we have to, to reset the agenda, but, but where the Tea Party just got it right where we haven't yet, and I know, you know, every, all parties are corrupt and the system is broken, but they ran for office. Well, a lot of the okay. Occupy people are people who got entirely behind the Barack Obama campaign, and now they're looking at a president who has come out in favor of Social Security for reform and um, Medicare reform and has not lived up to their dreams. So I don't think it precludes so, 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 so I mean, that they may do it again. I just think the idea that these are not people that have ever engaged in electoral politics. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that is, they've never engaged. I'm saying that they're, what do they're they do no now? Yeah. 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 I think this is such a, a pathology on, on the left, <laughs> the kind of qu their quickness to despair of electoral politics. I mean, yes, Barack Obama has failed to create a kind of um, Scandinavian welfare state in less than three years, but you know, I don't think that was the goal. Well, no, that, I mean I, that's what I would personally like to see. But I just it, what's amazing to me is having what you know, having written a lot about the right. You know, the right when they didn't get their way, you know, starting in the 70s, they went, they did it very systematically, took over the Republican Party from the grassroots, and eventually got presidents who were responsive yep. to them because they are the roots of the party. Time and again with Democrats, you see these kind of very intense mobilizations for presidential campaigns. And then a kind of complete throwing your hands up in despair when a single president fails to change but I don't the think system. It's and, and finally, if you really do believe that Wall Street power is as entrenched as I think a lot of us do believe, then you also cannot think that a single president in a single election can undo it. But look at Ohio and Wisconsin. These people are not only active at the federal level, they're also active, active at the local level, and that's where they're going next, I think. We've seen in both those states channeling from protest to electoral politics. I think it's a big open question about mm -hmm. if electoral politics is an agenda next. They've announced a Occupy Congress uh, movement that's going to happen in December. I want to talk about some of this with Anita Dunn, who is a top advisor at the Obama campaign, and she will join us after this break.